Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming today. Let me guess, you can hear my voice, but you can't hear my voice through the mic. Am I correct? Uh, can you hear me effectively without the mic? Awesome. We need the mic for the video. OK. Um, I will just do this. It will be fabulous. How about that? Excellent. This is my BBC reporter voice. You can enjoy this. Um, so thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Leslie Hawthorne, and I work on the open source and standards team at Red Hat. Our role is to make Red Hat's upstream projects wildly successful from the perspective of community management. So this is everything from uh, helping you understand what your users are going through to making sure that folks are aware of what our upstream projects are doing to cool events like this one and turning up and giving talks about how to make communities better, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some of you may know me from past lives at Google or the Oregon State University Open Source Lab. Um, I eat, sleep, and breathe open source community. Uh, and I also have no life, but that is cool because I am here to teach you fun things. So getting started, um, some of the best work that's been done in the field of negotiation theory and open source projects, and actually probably the only work that has been done in the field of negotiation theory and open source projects, has been done by the gentleman that you see pictured here, David Eaves. Uh, David has been hired as a contributor for the Mozilla project for the last several years. And he's done some pretty rigorous statistical analysis to do understand where contributors fit into the project, when they leave, and how to bring them back into the fold. So one of the tools that David was responsible for creating was simply, uh, was simply tracking uh, contributions from particular contributors and actually sending an email to someone who was in community land saying, have you noticed that Jane hasn't contributed a patch in 30 days, but Jane used to be one of our most prolific contributors. Maybe someone should send Jane an email and ask her how she's doing. And what they found as the results of this experiment was most of the time when you contacted folks who'd been dormant for a while, it was simply a matter of life happens. Got a new job, uh, moved house, etc. Sometimes what had happened was this person had been completely emotionally turned off from contributing to the project because of an interaction they'd had with a fellow community member, uh, a decision policy-wise that was made within the project, et cetera. And then that gave the community a uh, chance to actually analyze either those interpersonal relationships or the policy decision and decide if they wanted to make a change. But without having any of that data, how are you ever going to be able to analyze what you're doing? I think this actually feeds really well into what Spot's been telling us for the last hour about user experience design. So uh, the nice thing is uh, David's blog and all of his writing is linked at the end of this presentation in the resources section. So I uh, highly recommend checking out his work. So why are we all here today? Um, how many folks have heard of negotiation theory before they entered this room? OK, there's two of you. Great. You get a cookie. And you don't have to listen to the rest of this presentation. Um, so we're going to go over in detail what negotiation theory is and how it works. But just to frame this presentation, negotiations take place in free software projects all the time. We just don't think about them as negotiation. So discussions that happen on a mailing list back and forth as decisions are made, those are negotiations. Um, we have to negotiate with our users all the time when they submit bug reports and they're potentially very ill-targeted, like, I'm filing a bug in Fedora about how Firefox crashes, and uh, actually this is completely a Mozilla bug, but when you just mark this as won't fix and don't say, hey, the right place to get help is over here in the Mozilla uh, bugzilla, yeah, your users get upset. They feel like you're not helping them. They feel like they don't want to stick around. Uh, patch reviews, obviously, there's back and forth and discussion there, also negotiation. Bug triage is the same deal, uh, same thing with future prioritization, and the most interesting negotiations of all the airing of personal grievances. How often do you do that? Probably frequently. Um, do not do this in the issue tracker, but that's another talk entirely. <laughs> so the learning that we're going to go through today stems from work done on the Harvard Negotiation Project. And uh, this was a project that started in the 1970s specifically to help address some of the difficulties with the uh, Israel-Palestine conflict and to help the parties on both sides of that uh, dialogue be able to uh, interact together more effectively. And since the founding of the project, there's been 40 years of rigorous assessment, uh, research, um, a lot of role playing in uh, you know conferences like this one. There will be no role playing today. I want to spare you that. Plus, I left all my dice at home, so we can't do that. 
That was supposed to get a laugh. Darn it. No D&D &D fans in the audience, huh? All right, that's all right. Um, so the great thing is, as I was mentioning, uh, hello, David Eves' blog is a great one. Uh, there have been literally, I think, 24 or 25 books to come out of the Harvard Negotiation Project, uh, some of which I have even read. Um, and they all go through the various aspects of the negotiation theory that we're gonna go over today in a lot more detail. So, uh, getting started, elementary negotiation 101. Uh, going back to my point earlier about conversations we think of as negotiation and conversations that we don't think of as negotiation. Uh, the fact is, almost every conversation that involves a choice is a negotiation. And we never think of easy conversations as negotiations. So when our interests are highly aligned, and when we have an excellent relationship with someone, when they're our friend and we get along really well with them, we negotiate with them all the time. We don't think of it as negotiating. Hey, Tom, do you want to get dinner later? Sure. How about Thai food? Sure. Awesome. We just negotiated where we're going to have dinner. We don't think about that as a negotiation because Tom and I know we want to go hang out and we both like Thai food. Easy. However, in all of these other quadrants, these are the things that we automatically think of as being conversations that are going to be miserable and painful because they're not with somebody who is our total buddy and who wants the same things that we want. We think of this as traveling through the valley of suckitude and we automatically walk into conversations where we know that the likelihood of automatically getting what we want is low with fear, trepidation, and a lot of preconceived ideas about what the other person is going to say to us. So, for example, that's a good one. Oh, um, I need to go and negotiate with this other person uh, in a different team at my company about getting money to sponsor DevConf CZ, and I know they're gonna say no, even though they're totally my friend, and they agree that this is the best conference ever because their budget is you know, lower than they want it to be, and maybe they, I don't know, they're trying to save their money to go to OSCON, right? So their team can go there. And so I walk in, and I'm automatically assuming that when I go and have this conversation, I'm gonna have to explain, but the conference in Brno is really important, and you guys need to realize that OSCON has a completely different attendee profile, and this, and this, and this. I've already decided what the other person is gonna tell me. I've already decided how I am going to respond, and I've already decided how I want this conversation to end. Why am I even having this conversation? It's already taken place. I've already decided what you're going to say. I'm not even listening to you. I'm just waiting for my turn to talk. Is it any surprise to any of us that these conversations typically do not go well? No, because we've already decided what's going to happen. And instead of actually effectively communicating, we're simply taking a position and holding it and not really having an interactive dialogue with the other participant. We will review all of this throughout the rest of the slides. So the key to effective negotiation is being willing to ask for what you need. And that seems like a very simple, straightforward, and in fact, duh, statement, right? Of course you need to ask for what you need if you're needing to get something. Um, what I think we often don't realize is that being willing to ask for what we need has very little to do with the actual solution that we need and much more to do with being aware of who we are as individuals and what we're actually trying to get out of a situation. We frequently focus on what we want the outcome to be and not what we actually need out of the exchange. And don't worry, there's a really cool picture later with fish to illustrate this point in more detail. <clears throat> so, basics of negotiation. Walk into the situation being self-aware and understanding what your needs are. Ask the other party for what they need. Figure out where the common ground is. Where do your interests line up? Where can you both get what you want out of the situation? Reach agreement, yes, this is how we are gonna move forward, that sounds great. If you cannot, to agreement rather than both of you throwing up your arms and saying, that's it, I'm out of here, I'm taking my ball and going home and I don't want to talk to you anymore. Uh, you find the most optimal solution that fits with both of your needs. And, and at the end of the day, it's okay if you don't agree completely on how to get something done or how to accomplish a task or what feature needs to be implemented. The most important thing is that you've had a productive, constructive dialogue. 
So uh, first and foremost, this is just my own uh, take on negotiation theory. Other will tell you other things. Um, how many folks have heard of the term radical honesty? One, two, three, excellent. Four, five. Great. Um, so when you're going into any conversation with someone where it's about achieving your goals and them needing to achieve their goals, I'm advocating for practical honesty. Um, more often than not, again, we come into discussions with preconceived notions about what information it is okay to share, what information it is not okay to share, what we need to keep secret so that we uh, uh, retain our edge or our advantage in the discussion, which is a very assailatory kind of, uh, it's, we walk into these things preparing for a fight, right? And instead of walking in saying, I have certain things that I need, I understand that you have certain things that you need, and we're going to talk about how to get there together, and in order to show you that I have trust in you, and in order to show you that I care about you achieving your goals, I'm going to be honest with you about what my goals are. I know all of this sounds super basic, Implementation detail of this, very difficult. We will talk about some ways to make it easier. Um, how many of you feel maybe like when you tell people what they, you know, you know what you actually need and you try and do it very politely, uh, that you're being a completely, like you're lying? Okay, wow, that's so awesome. How many people here think that marketing is lying? Okay, there you go, that's what I thought. <laughs> many people feel like um, behaving diplomatically or tactfully in conversations with other people is the same thing as marketing, right? It's spin, you're just being full of crap. Um, and I cannot, <laughs> I cannot advocate strongly enough that that's not actually true. Um, there are many different ways to say something to people and the way that they're going to perceive what you've said very much depends on how you say it to them. And that's important because at the, end of, at the end of the day, you want to have an impact with what you have to say. So what's the difference between saying, <clears throat> your code is crap and I never want to speak to you again and I'm not entirely certain why anyone let you into this project in the first place, versus I think we should take a look at your implementation because I've noticed there are some issues with it and I think I understand the overall goal of what you're trying to create, but I'm not actually seeing it articulated in the code you've written and I think it can be improved. The second way, you're probably likely to get someone actually doing something about the problem. The first way, you're likely to get someone making some obscene hand gestures at you, which I will not replicate in this presentation because we're being videotaped. And uh, <laughs> otherwise, you know, hey, why not? Cut loose. Uh, and they're not going to help you. So what's the point in that? All right, more negotiation theory 101, positions versus interests. Um, I like this slide for many reasons, not the least of which is the cute little fish. So what is positions versus interests? Positions versus interests is a fancy way of saying um, outcome versus goals. So an example of my interest is um, I would like to live comfortably and not have to worry about paying my rent on time, feeding my two cats, and being able to go out to, you know, get a nice dinner, go to the movies, that kind of thing. I would like to have a comfortable life. A position is, I demand that my employer pay me one million dollars per year for my labor. Well, first of all, that's probably not going to happen. And second, by choosing a position, by saying, this is the only way that I can get what I want. I'm only going to get what I want this way. You're precluding the potential for you to actually get the things that you need because there are many, many different ways to solve a problem. So another concrete example. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine. She was looking to change jobs and she had a particular salary figure in mind. And she went to her employer and she said, this is my salary figure, this is how much I wanna get paid. And her employer said, well, new potential employer said, well, okay, uh, we understand that. That's not really in the salary range for this position. And at that point, she has a choice, she can say, thank you, but no thank you, I'm not taking the job. Or she can look and understand her interests. So after some more rigorous analysis, her interests weren't really, oh, I need to make this many dollars. Her interests were more around making a sense adequate to meet her needs and around professional development. 
So she went back to her would-be hiring manager and said, okay, so I understand that salary figure isn't particularly flexible. Let's talk about some perks. I really enjoy speaking at technical conferences. What is the travel policy for folks at the company to be able to speak at technical conferences? And the hiring manager said, well, it's about two per year, and we usually ask for domestic travel only. And she said, okay, well, that's cool, except there, there are two conferences in Europe where I speak regularly now on behalf of my current employer, and I'd really rather not give up those speaking engagements. It's really important to me to remain involved with that community. So her manager went back to the powers that be at the organization and said, you know what, we can totally do that for you. We can guarantee that you'll have the travel budget for two domestic speaking opportunities, two overseas speaking opportunities, the salary figure is the lower one, are you still happy with what you've got? She said yes. She's super happy and has been working as a software engineer at this place for the last three years, loving life, and still goes to Europe every year to give these speaking gigs, so life is good. Key takeaway, focusing only on your position or only on outcome takes away your opportunity to find a more optimal outcome, right? Focus on your goals when you're having discussions with people. Create a bigger pie, right? If all you're focused on is, I want a slice of this pie, well, you might get a really crappy small slice of the pie. Focus on, I want a really delicious dessert experience. Then maybe you get some pie, you get some sundae, chocolate mousse. I was hungry when I wrote this. Don't tell anybody. Another way that I like to think of this concept is, do you want to be right or do you want to win? Um, and what I mean by that is, all too often we get caught up in things must happen a certain way. We have to do this my way. I've thought about this really hard. Everyone in this room is an extremely intelligent person. We've thought about what we want, and we are pretty darn sure that we know the only way to get there because we've thought through all the possible scenarios really well. Okay? So you walk into a situation, this must be my way. I need to be right. I want you to do things the way that I think are the right way to do them. Eh, it doesn't really help us too much, right? The goal here is to win, right? We want to create positive change. We want our communities to function in a useful, worthwhile, productive fashion. Um, whether or not that happens because uh, along the lines of what I suggested or what you suggested or what she suggested or what he suggested, it doesn't matter. As long as we reach our goal, that's the key. So, ways to win. Um, when you're talking to somebody in any negotiation, and we'll get into specifics for FOSS projects in just a moment, um, often we argue from a place of emotion, and the difficulty with arguing or having a dialogue from a place of emotion is it's how we feel, and that doesn't necessarily help the other person understand our point or what we're trying to achieve or why we want to achieve it. By bringing in objective criteria into negotiation, these are things that both of you can look at and say, yes, this is true. This isn't a fact that you picked out because it just supports your point, right? These are facts that anyone has access to. Um, you guys don't have Kelly Blue Book here. So, uh, like on this, for example, on the second point, in the United States, there's this thing called the Kelly Blue Book, and it is kind of the Bible of how much you should pay for a used car. And so whenever you go into a used car dealer or whenever you go to buy a used car from an individual, you say the Kelly Blue Book value of this car is X dollars. So if I'm going into a negotiation with someone for a used car and they tell me it's going to be $30,000 and the Kelly Blue Book value is $20,000, I can point out to them in a polite, useful way that perhaps they are overinflating the price due to ignorance, assume ignorance, not malice, and instead, I would like to be paying $10,000 less. If I walk in and simply say, I think you're overcharging me. This is ridiculous. This is too much. Well, chances are they're not going to sell me the car. And what if I really want that particular car? You know, I'm not going to get what I want, and they're not going to get what they want, which is a sale. Objective criteria allows people to <clears throat> talk about a particular problem in a way where you're not necessarily emotionally invested in the data being presented, nor are they. So, ways to win in free software projects. The nice thing is software has a lot of objective criteria that it can be judged against, and that's absolutely fantastic 
because these things, these tools already exist for us. Um, does this code conform to the style guide? Passing unit tests, full test coverage. Um, are uh, users modding up issues in the issue queue, like starring it or upvoting, or simply saying plus one, this really needs to be fixed? All of these things are objective criteria. All of these things are available to us to help us negotiate within free software projects. Uh, the thing that I cannot uh, overstate is we very often, as creators of free software projects, fail our users and fail our contributors because we don't provide these objective criteria. How often do you kick back a patch saying, this doesn't meet spec, the style is all wrong, but you've never created a style guide or uh, uh, specifications for how code is supposed to look? Happens all the time. In fact, um, most first patches are rejected purely on style criteria, not because of technical merit or because it won't build, but because it doesn't conform to style criteria. 80% mm, of the time, that style criteria isn't published. That's bad. If we aren't providing these objective measures within our communities and providing them explicitly and making them obvious with huge text, blinking on the front page, okay, I don't actually recommend that, but making it very obvious how people are supposed to do things the right way in our projects, we're damaging our projects because we're not giving contributors the best possible vector of entry. Um, this should come as no surprise to anybody. Effective communication builds relationships. So what do I mean by this? Um, this goes back to my earlier point around radical honesty and this not being the art of being disingenuous. If you want people to have a more solid relationship with you when you're in, in the process of negotiating, you need to communicate effectively with them. Okay, duh. However, the important thing to take away from this is each negotiation is an opportunity to either strengthen your relationship or better align your interests. So let's go back to the old diagram. So if you're in a, if you're in a situation where you have a great relationship but your interests are poorly aligned, we get along really, really well together, but oh man, if I have to eat tofu one more time, I'm gonna throw up. Um, so you have your favorite vegan. You wanna go out to dinner with them. They're one of your best friends. Never again with the tofu. That's cool. Choose an alternate place to go out for dinner. All right, simple enough. If you're in a place where your interests are highly aligned, but your relationship stinks, your negotiation is an opportunity to build trust and rapport through your dialogue. And if you're in a situation where your interests you really don't get along with somebody, eh. baby steps toward enlightenment, right? By having a truthful, candid, and honest dialogue, maybe you can build trust, maybe you can build rapport, and come out of the situation a little bit better than you were before. Negotiation theory 101 continued. Um, so you can't always get people to agree with you. You just can't. Sometimes you are, as they say, not going to see eye to eye on a particular topic. And when you get to situations like that, what you're looking for is uh, something that the Harvard Negotiation Project refers to as the power of a positive no, and also as best alternative to no agreement. And the idea here is if we are not going to get along, if we are not going to agree on one specific path forward, how can we make sure that our dialogue has been effective for both of us? So <clears throat> let's, let's go back to food again, because it's right before lunch, and there you go. Uh, out and get dinner, you want to go out and get dinner, you want Thai, I want hamburgers, eh, but you don't like burgers, and I don't like Thai, what are we going to do? Well, maybe we could go out and get Indian food, it still has the spice for you, I enjoy Indian food, it's going to work, we both don't get what we want, but we both come away vaguely satisfied. That's a good thing. That helps to strengthen our relationship because we were able to work through a problem together and come to an effective compromise. And this also hopefully strengthens our interest because now we have a new, cool, fun experience that we can share together. So you've gone through the process of negotiating with someone and talking to them, and you've reached agreement, or you've come up with your best alternative to no agreement. Next steps. Solicit commitment, and you have to do this absolutely explicitly. The plan for moving forward is the following steps. And I know that this sounds silly because, well, you, you, once you've reached agreement, of course you know what to do next. You've already agreed to something. It's actually a little bit more difficult than that, right? Agreeing about what you're going to do doesn't necessarily mean that the other person 
understands what's been agreed to the same way you do, right? Human communication is fraught with peril, particularly if we think about it in the context of free software projects where we have multiple time zones, multiple languages, multiple cultural backgrounds. All of these things are interplaying when we're trying to communicate effectively with one another. So always explicitly state what are the next steps after we've reached agreement. Um, and also, you know, I get this question frequently, so I've actually just put it into the slides. What do you do if someone says, oh yes, I'm going to do such and such, and then they never do it? And it's, actually, it's okay to call somebody on failure to meet their commitments. I don't suggest doing it in a harsh or rude way. Remember, you want to win. But it's perfectly acceptable if someone says, oh yes, I'm, absolutely, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna fix that bug next week. And I understand that it's in the critical path and it's blocking everybody. And then next week rolls around and it's not done. Hey, you gonna work on that? Sure. Okay, next week after that, still not done. Hey, are you gonna work on that? Sure. You know, you promised you were gonna Yes, I promised. I'm totally gonna do it. Uh, week three rolls around. This is when you gently nudge somebody and say, hey, I just went ahead and submitted a fix. You wanna review this? It's pretty good. Yep. And also, it's perfectly acceptable to remind someone if they are not meeting what they agreed to, that the next time you have to negotiate with them, the next time you have to have a dialogue with them about getting stuff done together, you're going to have less trust in their ability to execute if they don't meet their commitments. So it's totally okay to call people on it when they don't actually live up to what they negotiated for. That's totally fine, but again, gently and with respect. Okay, practice radical empathy. Has anyone heard of radical empathy? Woohoo, I have made up a new term. Um, do folks know what empathy is? I am in a room full of geeks, so it's always worth asking. <laughs> okay, so to, to briefly define empathy. Empathy is the idea that you are able to um, understand what a person is going through uh, intuitively, right? You're not that individual, but you can understand what they want, and you can understand what they need, and you can understand where they're coming from, or uh, to use the idiomatic phrase, you can put yourself in their shoes. Um, and this sounds like it should be really easy because we all want the same things, right? Like everybody's here, we're participating in open source projects, we all care about code, we care about Fedora, we care about this, we care about that. It should be really easy for all of us to get along, right? And no, right? We are all still sadly human. Uh, and the idea of practicing radical empathy is instead of walking into a situation saying like, yes, I know everything that's going on, Ask yourself what you think the other person wants. What motivates them? What do you think their goals are going to be? Why do you think they want the things that they want? This is not the same as walking into a conversation having already decided what's going to happen. This is walking into a conversation being open to meeting someone else's needs and being ready to understand the information they have to present to you because you've thought through their position and their potential interests and are ready to be receptive to those uh, items. Okay, quick how-to on communicating successfully. So, uh, surprise, surprise, you have to listen to the other person talk. I know that this is shocking to all of you, but you would be shocked how often we don't actually listen. We're just waiting for our turn to talk. How often has that happened to you? And how do you usually know it's happening? You're speaking, you make a point, and right about the moment that you have closed your lips at the end of your sentence, the other person has already started talking. There is no way that they have processed the information that you have just given them. Because if they, or maybe they think way faster than I do, that's possible, but I doubt it. So actually take the time to listen to what someone has to say. And if you especially want to encourage folks to understand that you have taken the time to listen and absorb what they have to say, um, you paraphrase their point of view back to them. This is also called mirroring. So for example, someone tells me, um, goes through a long list of the reasons why they are very upset <clears throat> and think this presentation is terrible. And I sit and I listen and I say, so thank you very much, I appreciate that. I, 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 what I think I'm hearing you say is that uh, the microphone was not necessarily optimally placed, the slides could have had more cool pictures of kittens, and you could have spoken slightly slower because you as a Californian speak very fast and as non-native speakers of English, we would have appreciated if you'd slowed down a little bit. Is all that accurate right there? 
Yeah, you needed cats. I get it. Um, acknowledge your audience interests, right? What do they need to succeed? What do they want? Acknowledge the fact that you understand that they have a legitimate request, right? No one comes to you and asks you to make a change or asks you to engage in negotiation unless they think that what they have to say is very important. We're all busy people. No one's interested in having a conversation about something they don't really care about. Make sure that you acknowledge the fact that, you know, you appreciate that they've taken the time to bring this to you, that this is something that's very important to them and that you want to help them be successful and solve that problem, even if you're not the right person to help them solve it. Affirm their goals. What if you think their goals are totally wrong and way off base? At least they are thinking towards something that is useful and productive. Affirming goals you, more often than not just has to do with um, affirming common ground, as we've spoken about before. At the end of it, you create agreement. Yes, we're going to move forward and do this. That's great. Or best alternative to no agreement, we're going to do this other thing that will help us both be successful. So again, this has been a whirlwind tour through Negotiation Theory 101. Fortunately, there are many books about how you can do this more effectively. You can take a seminar from David Eves on how to do this more effectively. You can talk to me during lunch about how to do this more effectively. This is just to give you a taste of negotiation theory, what it's all about, and how it can help you be successful. Um, none of this is any secret. Uh, there, this is all, um, but I think that the one secret about negotiation theory is it is very easy to stand up here in front of all of you and rattle through these bullet points about how we can all get along together much more effectively. It, I make it sound like it's absolutely not a problem at all. That is a lie. It is actually very, very hard to have these conversations. It's very hard to engage in confrontation. Um, I've been working on this stuff for the last, I think, seven years, and I still feel this knot in the pit of my stomach every time I have to go have a difficult chat with somebody, right? I don't, it's not enjoyable. It never gets enjoyable. It never gets easy, right? So when you walk into these situations, just remember, the secret to being an effective leader in your career community is that you actually have to care. And that is your actually the most important part of any negotiation is that you are passionately committed to making things better and to having a productive dialogue and to have it coming out the other side with either a strengthened relationship or better aligned interests, even if you can't actually reach agreement. So the secret to being an effective community leader, you have to care about your fellow human beings, especially when they annoy the crap out of you, which is when you need to negotiate. And I will now take questions. That was a lot of information. There will be even more information later, but you can have information now if you want it. Or I could stand up here and do a song and dance number for the next 10 minutes. Don't make me do that. I'm feeling, why are there so many songs about rainbows coming on? You all want to eat lunch, don't you? Aha! We have a victim. So the question is, why do I think that IT people tend to have uh, difficulties with relationships um, I am now going to play armchair psychiatrist. Having no professional training in this whatsoever, but um, having been around geeks since I was born, my mom was a Unix programmer, so um, I think it's a couple of things. One, it's that uh, we have a very low frustration tolerance, which is why we all like to go and fix things. This doesn't work the way I want it to. Rather than just dealing with the fact that it doesn't work the way I want to, I'm going to go change it. Low frustration tolerance, right? Then there's the fact that we're all super smart, and I, I, how do I say this play? I can't. How do you feel with dealing with people who like, uh, stupid people, do you like dealing with stupid people? No, no you do not. And very often when we are smart and we have very good ideas, we tend to think that other people's ideas are stupid, whether or not they really are, because we've taken a lot of time to think about what we know, and we have come to very good conclusions 